The king ordered preparations to be made for his departure to Arogo. His daughter, the first princess Aristina, was to marry a barbarian. In the king's opinion, she was useless, but at least this way he could use the noble blood flowing through her veins. Her father, the emperor, ordered her into a political marriage with the hostile state of Irugo. A month later, Aristina set out on her journey, she followed her father's words unquestioningly, which was only an appearance. She was finally rid of her hated homeland and her even more hated father, who was indeed insane. Her father, the emperor, in order to satisfy his only desire to make her a winner, committed various kinds of violence against her. One day Aristina opened her eyes and saw that all the windows were closed and pillars of fire were blazing everywhere. She would have died if she had hesitated to get out, for she was six years old at the time. The emperor looked at the girl like a coal, and the man who locked the windows and started the fire was her own father. More than her burned lungs and more than her blistering limbs, her heart ached. In addition, right after that incident, she was separated from her younger sister for 10 years, which was not the shortest time. That was enough time for her heart to burn to the ground. However, she was fortunate that through her imprisonment, she was able to see her past life, and it was good for her to depart. But when she thought she was putting her sister down, she realized it was worth considering her future. Irugo was a place ruled by fire and iron. It was the land of barbarians, an isolated plain surrounded by demons. The barbarians that inhabit Irugo are neither humans nor demons, but creatures that have banded together. She was to sleep in the same bed with a man linked to a demon, a man more attracted to demons than a cold person like her. That's what her father thought. Irugo is an enemy state to them, and he was not happy to avoid war this time, because since long ago, everyone believed that Sylvanus is a conquering country. But only one territory, Irugo was unconquered. Her father, the current emperor, said he would accomplish the feat of conquering this state. However, he lost, and the reason he lost was Tarkan, her future husband. The king offered them a truce, believing that further hostilities would only bring casualties. Irugo, knowing that their lands were surrounded by demons, and that continuing the war would be a burden to the country, proposed a marriage of convenience. This meant that the countries were no longer at war with each other and were allies. But in reality, her father had no intention of ending the war, as the truce was only meant to buy time. He plans to deprive Irugo of all determination to win and then to start the war again and occupy the territory. That's why he sent Aristina as a discarded card, because her death will fall on Irugo's shoulders and declaring war on the country that has made a marriage alliance will be a moral obligation. However, the emperor did not realize that the card he wanted to kill would give him a huge surprise. But for that to happen, Aristina first needed to establish a partnership with one man, her husband. From the moment she was sent away in a carriage, instead of through a portal, she suspected that something was wrong, and of course she was right, for she hadn't left the carriage for almost ten days, after which it seemed to her that these limbs were not hers. When she wanted to change her uncomfortable dress, the knights had knocked at the carriage window, and now she was suddenly asked to get out. The place where they made a stop was modest, but tea and desserts had been prepared. Looking into the tea she saw a moment from the future, as a girl spilled boiling water on her, and everyone around her laughed, for this was the appearance befitting a barbarian bride. It was the emperor's eye, the ability that her father coveted, and the ability he thought she could not possess. But she could see the past, present, and future. She decided to look around, and as expected, a girl wearing the same clothes as she had seen through the cup approached her. In other words, what she had just seen through the cup was bound to happen in the future. And at the moment when the girl was about to spill boiling water on her, she pushed her away and the water poured out on the girl herself. As I expected, the future Aristina saw with the Emperor's eye completely changed. The other girls came up to her to find out why she did it, but it wasn't Aristina's fault as she just stood up from her seat. The fact that the water spilled wasn't her fault after all, she wasn't supposed to be the nanny. After watching the girls, Aristina realized that they were bullying someone else but they didn't even think that they could get hurt themselves. By doing so, they realized they could hurt themselves. And at least on a subconscious level, the scar the girl received would make them stop their bullying. The princess had originally thought that she would be quiet until she arrived in Arugo, but the scene seen through the emperor's eye changed her mind. After all, 
she can't use her ability whenever she wants, and if she sat still, she would really get burned. Many of the girls there had heard that during the 10 years of confinement, the princess had become insane and had no education and no manners like a commoner. But they wondered why she behaved so elegantly. After that day, it was felt that the maids became more hesitant in their abuse. Apparently, they felt sorry for themselves after all. They only capriciously tried to trample her clothes and really thought it would hurt her. Compared to splashing boiling water on Aristina, the level of such bullying was very cute. Even though her clothes were dirty, they were much more comfortable from that tight dress. However, even though it was only a political marriage, she needed to prepare a new set of clothes because she only had the dresses she had worn in her confinement. Yes, and besides, she couldn't even wear that new dress as it was completely stained. Even though Aristina knew about the emperor's plans, she felt that this dress would be perfect for the wedding. A couple of days later, they finally arrived at the western gate of Arugo, where the people of Sylvanus were considered vile and treacherous, as well as weak-willed cowards. The guards arrived to greet the attendants, as well as the first princess, Aristina. But they were surprised why they had come by carriage rather than using a portal. With maids worrying about their outfits and carriages adorned with magnificent gems, the guards could already tell what the princess was like without even looking at her. However, they were extremely astonished when a small girl came out of the carriage covered in mud and dirt, looking like a dirty lump. Compared to the fancy carriages, her outfit was old and dirty, and many people had already realized what the Emperor of Sylvanus was up to. He wanted to send the girl there in the scruffiest way possible because the war had been avoided, but Sylvanus was only waiting for the moment because he didn't care how she would be treated in Arugo, and on the contrary, he wanted her to be received so coldly in order to make the princess as dirty as possible. He ordered knights and fancy gifts that would demonstrate the still strong fighting power of Sylvanus, and the princess, as a dirty gray mouse, was to demonstrate that she would be perfect for a trash like them and fit their status, which was an obvious mockery. Hearing the outrage of the people, Aristina realized that this was quite the expected reaction. She could not shy away from such treatment, however, and as she approached the man, she wondered if this man was her husband, for she had heard that Tarkin would meet her at the entrance gate. It looked like this man had the highest status in Irugo, and she thought his face was very handsome. He had a pleasant voice and was also very courteous and not embarrassed by her appearance. However, Aristina noticed that he was too polite to her, and as it turned out he was beneath her in status as he was assigned to escort her. She was upset that it was not Tarkan. She was told that he had gone hunting, which surprised her, because it was a sign that their marriage life would not be too good, and the princess thought that her future husband was shy. Aristina thought that the best way to show her good-natured side was to smile and insist on an answer, although she had not thought about it, but this was different from her first stay in the empire. There was no need to worship anymore. There were no people there who shunned her, hated her. In other words, they didn't expect anything from her, so she didn't have to live up to their expectations, her eyes shining like stars in her dirty face and the maids resented that the knights dared to call her princess dirty and didn't realize who they were that they dared to ask the princess to put on Irugo's clothes before even entering the palace. It was their reaction to Durant recommending that the princess wash and change her clothes before entering the palace. Aristina realized that before this, Sylvanus's men were not at all alarmed because it was too blatant a way to start a fight. Durant took a step back to avoid the quarrel as the king was not present, and he left it at that, for the prince wished for the war to end, and though the political marriage would not be dissolved, the rumors would fall on Tarkin's shoulders, so they were not to stir up controversy. As they approached the palace, Duran noticed carriages bearing the coat of arms of the third prince Martin, the coat of arms of the first princess, the coat of arms of Lady Enicarina, and many others who had apparently decided to reconnoiter. In fact, Mr. Tarkan couldn't come to meet his bride because of the monsters, but the guy didn't understand why the other royals were idling then. Inquisitive eyes were directed at Aristina, inspecting her from head to toe. Countless gazes were pointing at her like spears and arrows. They were meeting a bride from a distant country. When they saw her, 
they did not understand what they expected from a low-born consort, for they were expecting the so-called Princess of Sylvanus, but the girl did not even look like a beggar who hung around under the bridge of the river. Her maid said that she did not think that if she got to Arogo, something would change, because she could not expect a different reception, and now the princess would finally realize her place and be meek. Duran didn't understand what the people who came with her from their homeland were doing. They were supposed to protect her, but all they did in return was mock her. Suddenly, precious silks that could not be exchanged even for a chest of pure gold were snatched from the knight's hands and taken to Prince Irugo himself. Tarkan wrapped the girl in this silk and lifted her in his arms, saying that the most precious thing should be given to his bride, and his eyes sparkled like sunbeams. Though the prince did nothing remarkable, the proud Selvans did not utter a word. However, after they left, the boy asked the princess not to be mistaken, because he did it because he didn't like the way his siblings talked to her, not because she was pretty. It was obvious, however, that this act would be dangerous if he liked her, since she was like a lump of dust covered in sweat, and what could be said of his preference if she came to his liking? He ordered the maids to wash the princess. Aristina, on the other hand, noticed that he was overstained with the blood of the monsters. Though it wasn't as noticeable on the black robe, but it was just as stained. They were not married yet, and therefore they had to decide who would go to wash first. The guy tried to find the words, because he was used to communicate with soldiers on the battlefield, and so do not treat girls who grew up in beautiful castles. The man realized that she meant that they were not married yet, so they could not bathe together. And when she wondered if he would go to wash, he replied that he would wash elsewhere. It struck Aristina that it was normal for castles to have several places for bathing. She had lived alone and in confinement for too long, so she had forgotten some things and asked the maid to guide her. Tarkin, on the other hand, thought the girl was strange. Initially, he thought she was crying, but if she was related to the blood aristocrats and grew up in a beautiful palace, she was not used to such constant situations. But she looked as if she had become emotionless, for she was no longer able to be proud. However, he didn't understand why he was so overwrought. When it was decided to make a political marriage, he did not fix his attention on the woman he was being married to. The girl was very happy since she saw that there was a bath and also warm water. She had not been cared for in this way since she was a young girl. The maids had a business-like demeanor and professional approach, but she had only met maids that ignored her constantly, so such respectful behavior was strange to her, which meant her future husband was charismatic and resourceful. It was good that their negotiating opponents had such abilities, and Aristina was obliged to win her husband over to her side. The girls stopped, Aristina thought they were done, but the maids looked into her mystical violet eyes that looked like dawn and sparkling silver hair. The maids helped her rinse her head a few more times before she sent them away and decided to put all her plans on hold. For now, it was worth resting. It was only because of this moment that she thought the journey to Irugo for the wedding had been a success. There was a splash of water which was a sign of the activation of the Emperor's eye, and she hoped her vision would be useful. On the water appeared her husband Tarkin, who looked like his current self, so the memories were either from the near future or the past. No matter how much he liked the design of the garment, he couldn't continue to walk around in the blood-stained garment. So she hoped it would be the near past, because even though it was a political marriage, she didn't really like dirty men. A girl in beautiful clothes came up to him and asked him if he liked the princess, but the man replied that it was impossible because his heart was unchanging. It was obvious to Aristina that there was no love in a political marriage, and if Tarkin's beloved was in her vision, it could play into her hands and she would have another bargaining chip in her negotiations with him. She was anxious to rest, but now she had a chance to get away from the watching eyes, for at the same time the servants who had come from Sylvanus were inspecting the interior of the palace. Diona, the girl next to Tarkan, was happy that the man was still the same. Relaxed as a predator, hard to approach, elegant and dangerous, for she was surprised when he suddenly stood up for the princess. Suddenly, they were told that the princess had come to see him. Tarkan and the rest of the villagers reacted very strangely to her, for they compared her to that clod of dust. Diona had forgotten her beauty and panicked for what if the princess thought she was ignoring her, for she could not let a conflict break out in front of Tarkin. 
She thought it was luck that the first princess had arrived, and not the second one who was considered incredibly beautiful. But as it turned out, there was no reason to be happy. Tarkin asked her why she was looking for a meeting with Diona, but Aristina answered that they would soon become a married couple, so they could just have tea together and talk. She took a sip of tea and was amazed, because it was the first time she drank such high-quality tea. Although she had not come there of her own free will, she did not think that it would be so good, but it was better to keep it a secret from her husband. However, she admitted that she did not come there to have a nice chat with him, and decided to go straight to business. Offering him to start a business, not love, not power, does not make much sense to her. All she needed was a lot of money. With that money, she planned to buy her freedom to go wherever she wanted and look at whatever she wanted, and no one else would be able to lock her up. She would keep her eyes open for those visions that only manifested on the water side, but for that she would need a lot of money and to combine her and Tarkin's powers. Even though she had seen her past life through the Emperor's eye, in this world, her entrepreneur's disease was the cause of her troubles. For it was the eternal desire to get more money by taking extreme risks. She clarified, however, that she did not ask the man to borrow money or ask him to invest. However, she noticed that the man was looking at her with a very annoyed look and asked her not to look that way. The man hoped that she wasn't going to use the money allocated for the prince's upkeep as a business investment. Aristina had only talked to people a few times, so her way of relaying information had become rather strange. She explained that the arranged marriage had politically woven them together. So it would be good to create a victorious union in which they would help each other. And she was not talking about a strong friendship, but about business. Tarkin asked what Aristina would do if he helped her. He didn't know what she could do with her thin hands that looked like they couldn't lift a fork. The princess realized that he did not trust her at all, because at first he treated her as a fraud, and now she was too fragile for him. That's why she suggested him to sit down at the negotiating table, where she could show her talents. At the same time, the other royals were discussing that the princess looked like a beggar, and probably did not understand what a royal wedding was, because they considered it neglect and heard that the princess had a mental illness. Her consciousness would constantly leave her, then return to normal. It was because of this that she was kept in isolation for 10 years, because everyone in the palace knew about this secret. They didn't understand how His Highness Tarkin would marry such a girl. And if Tarkan became the crown prince, this girl could become the wife of the heir to the throne, which would undermine Irugo's authority. His Highness Tarkan was now His Majesty's favorite, and the war was over. He had performed great feats on the battlefield, but ruling a country was a completely different matter. That was why, in their opinion, His Highness Hamir was far more suited to the role of Crown Prince. Their conversations quieted down as Tarkin passed by them. They realized that they should start watching their words, because with the end of the war, the Lord was in the palace very often. The girls admired his appearance, his straight nose and golden eyes, and whenever they looked at him he was noble and handsome, which made their hearts flutter. Following him was Aristina, and all were surprised, for they did not recognize her, for she was no longer the beggar in rags, but looked quite different. King Irugo Nefter was informed that the princess and His Highness Tarkin had decided to visit him. He was surprised, for the official audience with the Sylvanus delegation was to take place tomorrow afternoon and did not understand why the princess had come separately. The second princess, Enikarina, intervened in the conversation and suggested that they meet after all, for she was interested in seeing the rumored princess who was to become a member of their family. However, the king knew that she and the other princes and princesses had gone to see her daughter-in-law, and her intentions were obvious, but still said that he had no government business and saw no reason to refuse. The girl gloated, for it was getting funnier and funnier, and she could make that dirty princess laugh right in front of her father. Looking at Tarkan, she thought that he was worried about that beggar. Maybe he would even beg to change the wedding terms. Annika was worried because her father wanted the Princess of Sylvanus, but she didn't think she was too valuable because no one could be her father's favorite more reliably than the princess herself. To her surprise, Aristina entered the hall with graceful gestures and precise manners, but the king had been told that it was not the second but the first daughter who was isolated, so he did not have high expectations. Aristina exhaled, 
for she easily memorized what she saw through the emperor's eye. However, she was very worried that her body would not obey her, but judging by their reaction, she had made a good first impression. She was served a dessert called Frinfran jelly, which was Arugo's specialty. Unlike regular jelly, it was more elastic and had a sweet and sour flavor. And when you mix the sweet and sour flavors, it must feel like there's a party going on in your mouth. If a famous chef with a strict and picky taste praised it, it would become fashionable to serve Frinfran even in hostile countries like Sylvanus. The princess saw the original in person and wanted to taste it very much, but she stopped herself because she couldn't eat it until it proved its worth and she was craving for someone else's property. Then she promised herself to demonstrate her skill and salesmanship. Tarkan was uneasy and hoped that she had no intention of selling anything to his father. The king said that the audience would be held in the afternoon, but he asked what reason the girl had for wanting to meet him beforehand. However, she was interrupted when the other princes and princesses entered the room, saying that they were honored to see such a high-ranking Sylvanus person, and asked if Tarkan had waited for her because she was rumored to be a beauty and the empire had been famous for beautiful women for thousands of years. However, they were stunned when they saw the princess, who was indeed called a beggar. Not knowing that the princess's appearance had changed, they deliberately praised her in order to humiliate her. The princesses were confused and tried not to show any doubts. They realized that she had washed and dressed up before coming and now looked like a completely different person. However, they did not understand why the queen had not given such important information when she sent them there. The princesses decided to get out of it by starting to resent how Aristina could not recognize them since they were not servants. Was the princess from Sylvanus completely unaware of such simple rules of etiquette? They abruptly changed their behavior after deliberately praising their opponent. This was the characteristic speech style of royalty. Their speech was like the swords of knights, and Tarkin himself was still not used to the acting and masks that the palace aristocracy tried on. He had many enemies in the castle, and because of that the princess was inconvenienced, which she should not be. He needed to keep the princess safe until things settled down, so he asked her to keep silent. The girl thought that if she showed her abilities at least a little, it would not be rude, and she should ask him to become a business partner. Aristina said that they had a little misunderstanding, and she did not ask who she was, because at some point it seemed to her that they had already met somewhere. The princess was surprised that she remembered her. Aristina started to ask the others, because she was sure that she had seen them somewhere. The princess realized that she had just confirmed everything with the help of the dialogue, and she had not just mistaken her, but remembered her exactly, because she had seen them there. Although she had heard that during the isolation, Aristina could not learn anything and went crazy, but in fact it was not true at all. Aristina's life was a world that happened to be reflected in the water. She remembered everything because it was a world without observation and good memory. Annika realized that her father, the king, was interested in the princess. And if the princess told her father about what happened in Tarkhan's palace, their unexpected visit to the tea room would not be seen as something funny, but was dangerous. In one of them, Aristina recognized the very princess who said she had low-born blood in her. Stalin's gaze was filled with contempt and hostility. Even though she looked like an adult, she thought like a child. The second princess calmed her down, for she was quite savvy, as the crown prince of Arugo had not yet been determined. And now there was a battle between the factions of the first prince Hamir, born of the queen, and the second prince Tarkan, who might take the throne. Unlike Prince Hamir, Tarkan is born of a commoner, which is his political weakness. However, the more problematic and underlying cause is the battle between the old and new factions. It was the same in her past life, and she asked, did the princesses doubt her membership in the imperial family or were concerned about her origins? In the meantime, the queen was informed that the princesses and princes had gone to the main palace. And since this was an unofficial audience, their visit would not look unusual. She hoped that Enika and the other princesses would do well, as they were very perceptive and were in her entourage. The other princesses began to blame Stalin, because she was small and did not know when to speak and when to keep silent, and unfortunately, she could not distinguish reality from fiction. 
So they asked Aristina to be magnanimous. Stalina did not understand what had happened because her sister had always been on her side. Tarkin thought that his fiancée had done a very clean job, but the official audience with the Sylvanus representatives would take place tomorrow. And if the Sylvanus knew what had happened today, they would not miss their chance to break the peace treaty that made Arugo the winner. But it was not done yet, and it was like walking on thin ice. Trade agreements, right of passage, right of use and more, even if they were the words and actions of an immature princess. This time Sylvanus would try to use them as an excuse to get more profit, and then it would be on the queen's shoulders, so they would try to make it up to her. But the only question was, whose side the king had already taken? When Aristina arrived in Arago, she didn't think to pay attention to their rude behavior and just wanted them to be quieter. But then she noticed the king's gaze on her for a long time. As long as it went against her plan and she got King Irugo's attention, it was pretty good. And if you thought about it, she was worth the attention. And she figured that if she stepped out of line a little, it wouldn't be a problem of national importance. It would be a problem of a princess of an enemy state rebuking his daughters. Now she would be living in Irugo, so contempt for the king would not play into her hands. So she smiled and looked at the king and said that she had been insulted when she arrived there and she was very sad. She was called a hillbilly and despicable and it was not just condemnation because of her origin. She heard it herself and saw people who didn't even know her. The king replied that the imperial family had finally decided to sign a peace treaty and this could make things worse. So he would interrogate everyone present and find out the truth and bring those responsible to justice. Princess Annika thought that if Aristina now tells her father everything, the dirty war will start and the recognition of the princess will fall. So she thought about taking responsibility but asked Stalin to apologize to the princess. She realized that they had made too many jokes about the princess, as well as being subject to rumors and their own inattention. And it was all because of her ignorant half-sister because her explosive nature had to be taken into account. With a grin, Stalina apologized, and the princess remembered that she had said something else about her low-bornness. Therefore, she was obliged to apologize to the princess properly. Stalina didn't want to apologize to her and didn't understand why she had to do it in front of this half-breed. After all, she had just taught this princess, who was hated by everyone, it was quite funny that the stubborn, arrogant fourth princess apologized and kneeled down. Tarkin watched to see if Aristina was pleased with the apology, and he thought she was pleased. But it was a little different from what he had imagined. She looked like the one who had brought the princess of the entire country to her knees with just a few words, which Tarkin liked very much. Aristina in turn realized that there was a lot of disagreement between the half-siblings, but that wasn't all. She had to deal with the situation and didn't expect it to turn out this way because the princess had never insulted her and she didn't ask her to apologize. So she leaned over and said that she just asked if there was anything else she wanted to say to her and giving her hand she pretended as if it was nothing to her. She was uncomfortable watching the princess kneeling. From the outside, she was magnanimous with a patient measured speech as well as a cold stare. With a smile, the king who was watching this realized that Princess Aristina was smart because she knew her position and knew how to use it, which was brave and within the bounds of propriety, nothing excessive. He asked them all to sit down, for they had come unexpectedly during the tea party and made a mess. If you look at it that way, they acted too recklessly. Princess Annika said that she was very sad because she didn't understand why her relatives had acted like that on that day as they were to become a family they made such a bad first impression of themselves and didn't know what to do if the princess misunderstood and disliked them. Aristina noticed that unlike the people of Irugo, the princess had a frail build, white skin, and she and her father had the same turquoise eyes. She was the daughter of the queen, which meant she was Hamir's younger sister. When Annika suggested calling her sister, Aristina thought of that child, her younger sister. So she gladly agreed because the princess was very much like her little sister. After all, the second princess was a beautiful and sweet child. Even when Christina was a baby, she watched her and saw her through the emperor's eye while she was imprisoned. And even when she was locked up because of her, the girl remained sweet. 
The princess felt sorry for Aristina, for she had made a political marriage without love, and when she arrived she met rough and blood-smelling men. Annika pondered how else to get her attention, but realized that if this silly girl loved her too much, it would be annoying. But she had to be kind to please her father. Aristina did not notice how she addressed her in the first person, and asked if she could call her informally, since they were now sisters. Or even in communication between sisters, it was necessary to adhere to etiquette. Aristina wasn't very good at it, so she admitted it was her mistake, but she thought the princess was sincere. Annika, on the other hand, was outraged, because she didn't understand what sincerity was about, since she could only be a little sister to Hamir. She was annoyed because Aristina didn't understand the innuendo at all, and went on to say that her younger sister always treated her with respect, and even at a very young age, she spoke to her formally. But Annika grinned maliciously, for Aristina still did not know that if the king was brought a frinfrin jelly, he always gave it to her, for she was very fond of that jelly. So she said that his majesty could have given his portion to her as usual, but to everyone's surprise, Aracina began to feed the king with the jelly from a spoon. Tarkin said that even though the ceremony hadn't taken place yet, after the wedding she would be their family, so she could start calling him father right away. And it was strange to hear such surprise from Annika when she already addressed the girl as a member of the family and her sister. The great king of metal and blood was cold stern, but now he was doing such a thing in front of everyone and agreed to have Aristina address him as her father. The other princes were surprised because they thought that he was going to shout that the jelly should be put away immediately because his majesty was eating a dessert that he had never touched before. It looked like the princess was really special. In fact, the frinfran jelly was quite difficult to pick up, but the practice had paid off. Earlier in Sylvanus, Aristina had seen her younger sister feeding the emperor frinfran while she watched through the emperor's eye and tried to pick up the clay with a fork. There were times when she really wanted to hear her father's praise, but after she realized that he dreamed not of a daughter, but of the emperor's eye, she abandoned her dreams. There was one secret, a secret that neither the servants nor even Tarkin knew. Princess Annika didn't just want to eat because of what she was begging for jelly beans. The whole worry was that His Majesty the King had a secret. He had a broken right wrist and though the injury had no effect on his life and in wartime, it can easily cause turmoil and anxiety among the people, as well as undermine morale, but the king kept it hidden. But since such a slippery food as jelly could raise suspicions, he preferred to avoid it. But nevertheless, Flynn Fran jelly, which is the traditional dessert of Erugo, is always served at official dinners. Only the king's attending physician and Princess Annika knew about this secret, which is why he always gave the princess his jelly. Many people thought that although His Majesty especially appreciated Prince Tarkan, but among all the princesses, he favored Annika the most, because she was very nice, and also it was a reliable support for the Prince of Peace and the Queen. She planned to strengthen the position of Hamir's brother so that everyone would call her the favorite of her father, but if she wanted to protect the Emperor's secret, she should have just fed her father herself. From the point of view of Tarkan, who didn't know about her father's injury, it might have seemed a little unreasonable, for there was nothing worse than not being able to eat what you wanted while you were sick. Aristina didn't know if the king would be angry at her for treating him like a child, because she had been around people so little that she didn't know anything. She was used to formal communication and had no idea how she would react in such a situation. The king smiled and said that even though he was not the initiator of this marriage, he was really satisfied with everything, and he had to repay her for making him happy and asked her what she wanted. The girl was amazed, for she was allowed to call him father, and he called her by her diminutive name. It had finally happened. She knew she shouldn't make a big deal out of it, but it turned out that he had become a father to her, which made her very happy. When he asked her if she wished for something, he hit the target, because she had one wish, Although actually the fact that she fed His Majesty was actually seen by her through the Emperor's eye, she didn't expect that she would dare to do so. She finally had the chance to reveal the true purpose of her visit, because she said she wanted to cleanse Irugo of the reputation of the country of barbarians. She had finally spoken and seemed to have proven her skills, for she was a treaty that deserved to be sealed even without reading its terms. Everyone was shocked by her statement, 
for in fact she hadn't actually said anything to Tarkan about her plans on the way to the tea room. After meeting the king and queen, his siblings played it up. Tarkin, however, said that he had noticed her crying when she first arrived at the palace when the royal scions bullied her, for she was the princess of Sylvanus and not used to such things. However, the girl said that she was used to it, and seeing his serious expression, asked did he not know that she was in confinement. After all, the rest of the royal family knew about it. She was surprised how he didn't know about it, how much he didn't care about his own fiancée, come to think of it, when she arrived at the palace, she had a vision through the emperor's eye, and maybe he didn't like her because she wasn't just dirty. She finally realized what he was worried about and said they were going to have a political marriage anyway because they needed to mend their relationship and ask directly if Tarkan wanted war. She hoped that he would answer her honestly because while they were talking in Sylvanus, everyone was preparing for war. And among her things, there was a deadly poison prepared to kill Tarkin. At the same time, the Sylvanus maids were given a tour of the palace and were surprised that a barbarian state that could only fight monsters had mastered such an art of construction. They began to discuss the man who was rumored to be a monster, but contrary to their expectations, he turned out to be quite handsome and not suitable for the beggar-like princess. So they hoped that he would soon lose interest in the princess because she was a savage who spent 10 years in confinement, and it was obvious that she was strange. However, their conversation was interrupted by one of the knights who informed them that their princess had gone to meet King Irugo. When he heard about it, she had already returned from the meeting, and now she was talking alone with that barbarian. They were angry because they thought the foolish princess still didn't understand her place. Tarkin told the princess that he was not the kind of man who wanted war. But the girl explained that the point was that the easiest way to win a war was to kill her. She said that by being a spy, she could pass important information to Sylvanus, or she could try to kill him by putting the prince's guard down. But there was no reason for her to risk it for Sylvanus, for whom she had no good feelings, and the emperor hated her, which meant that she had not come there of her own free will. She decided to take the initiative and tell the first thing. The fact that she was kept in confinement was easy to find out after a little investigation. Tarkin already realized that it was not a topic that could be brought up lightly. However, if the Emperor was so unwilling to see her that he had isolated her, there was a good chance that the wedding had been arranged only for her death. The girl smiled and said she didn't want to die. And if the prince did not want to incite war, their interests coincided and she was ready to show her talents. Besides, she could take over the work he couldn't deal with during his absence, and it would be good to create a victorious union, because now there was a battle for the place of the heir. She only wanted to create a union to help him, and she was willing to do her best to keep him safe, because peaceful relations depended on it. Tarkin only realized that all this long dialogue about the trade alliance, about victory and everything else, was only to save her life, which was a matter of course. He wondered how she'd been treated if she didn't even care who her marriage partner was. And even when she was being bullied, her overly calm expression pissed him off. Arisina ate all the cookies and realized she hadn't talked so much in a long time. And she had a sore throat, and the eternal smile was taking a lot of energy. She didn't know if it looked strange that she was smiling so hard. It was her way of surviving through the emperor's eye for it was better to smile when convincing the person she was talking to. Today was her first time in conducting such long conversations, but she hoped she had done pretty well. Oh, and unlike their first meeting, Tarkin seemed more gentle, though there was a little of the pervert in him. But luckily for him, they understood each other, and finally it was time to act. Because of that, she offered to help each other for the sake of common safety. They were devoid of any love as business partners, Arkin asked her if she wanted something other than that, to which the girl happily replied that she had a great business idea. After talking to Tarkin, she was met in the hallway by the knight, asking where she had gone that she was coming back so late. Since she had come to Irugo, she should behave properly, as she had been reprimanded by the maids because of the princess and had to scare her so that the princess would not leave again. But the prince appeared behind her back, and the knight was frightened saying that it was the internal affairs of Sylvanus and he should not pay attention to it. With his whole look he showed that he needed the princess's help 
and only she could calm this barbarian. Tarkin replied that it was their internal affairs, but it concerned his fiance directly and approached him and pushed him so that the boy flew off. Lying on the floor, the knight was indignant, saying he would definitely file a protest. But Tarkin thought he was her fiance's dog, so it was better for his mistress to decide what to do with him. The prince was not happy that Tarkin was holding him down with his foot and asked the princess to hurry up and subdue him, but she only looked at him confused. Aristina was really at a loss, for these people were always like this, always discussing and insulting her, saying that she didn't talk much and wasn't intelligent, but she was pretty in person. When they went to Irugo, she was soiled, but they thought it would change everything, even though they knew she was destined for marriage to that savage barbarian. Remembering all these moments, she was surprised that now one of these people was asking for help. So she approached her fiancé saying to step on the guy even harder. After Tarkin fulfilled his bride's wish, he ordered the servants to send him to the dungeon. The prince's hand was so strong, because he was a warrior he easily dealt with that night. And the girl finally understood him, because beating others he felt delight and she respected his tastes. Thanks to him, she also enjoyed it. She was shown to her bedroom, and though she would only use it until the marriage ceremony, it was perfectly cleaned, as if she were truly welcome. Even though the rest of Yi said she had come to Irugo to die, she was really glad she was getting married to a marriage of convenience. After all of Irugo's maids left her chambers, her maids from home surrounded her waiting for her to say something to them. Aristina, on the other hand, felt that they weren't even on the same level as dogs. After all, they had no sense of duty or trust, and even dogs were cuter. Palace companions are formed from ladies who came from the highest aristocratic families. They are different from the usual maids and courtiers. After all, in the end, they become interlocutors for the imperial personages or assistants in business. Only noble and erudite girls from the highest aristocratic families can become companions. But the girls accompanying her were from unremarkable families, ordinary ladies. Entering the abandoned palace of the princess, they only giggle and plunder the budget little by little. Despite the cries of the maids, Aristina thought that today she had had a busy day and was very tired, so she wanted them to leave as soon as possible. The maids looked at her and thought that the princess had always been like this, and no matter how much she was scolded and reproached, she was careless and could not understand anything, even when her holy clothes were trampled with dirty feet. And even when her food was filled with rubble, she was a fool who blinked her eyes and understood nothing. It was because of this girl that she had to go to Irugo. She didn't want to babysit a forgotten princess, and she wouldn't have had to if her family had more money. The maid looked at her and said that it seemed that Aristina had forgotten her immediate duty and that she had been sent to Irugo to die. The princess looked at her calmly and said that the girl was mistaken. After all, they were in Erugo, not Sylvanus, saying that they really couldn't even be dogs if they had no idea how they should behave from now on. And she didn't know what to do since she only took in well-mannered dogs and wondered what was usually done with wild mutts, assuming they were trophies or prey for a predator. The maids were outraged and thought she was mocking them, promising to report it to his majesty. Aristina realized how stupid they were, but didn't know if she should tell them and show these indescribable fools the reality. Rosalind's headmaid stepped back, remembering what she had been told about how Tarkin had seriously beaten the knight and wondered if all those eye blinks in response to the taunts and rebukes were just covering up the princess's claws. Aristina, who used the mask of a fool, flawlessly deceived everyone. The princess went on to say that dogs understood human speech perfectly well, after all, they were smart. If they were told to sit down, they sat down or waited. She wondered where she could find such a dog. Suddenly, Rosalind came and knelt down in front of her and started barking, because all this time, she was the one who had been bullying the princess the most. And if she was thrown into Aristina's hands where she had no ties, she had no choice but to bark in order to survive. The princess was also surprised, for even she could not have predicted it, for the maid changed her position very quickly, but it was clever, for if a man was in danger, he could pretend to be a dog. The maid continued to act like a dog, barking and taking the ball from the princess's hands, from which the other maids were terrified and thought that she had gone mad. Rosalind realized that after all her words, nothing could be changed, 
and for the sake of survival, she was ready to pretend to be a dog as long as necessary. The other maids, who did not realize the situation, looked at her as if she were crazy. Aristina wanted to make her a hunting dog, and Rosalind liked it, for she was willing to bring the trophy she wanted, and when she had caught all the game, she would have only one goal, the princess. On the Arugo training ground at the same time Tarkin was practicing, remembering all the nasty words the royals had said about him and his fiancée. He had never been ashamed of his origins, but marrying into a Sylvan imperial family, whose veins were said to have gold in them, had been the king's obvious intention, to make up for his political weakness as an illegitimate child. He realized that the struggle for the throne was becoming more and more serious, and this battle could not be avoided. He was distracted from his thoughts by Durant, who said that all the warriors were already assembled and he should go to the conference room. As he entered, each of the boys greeted him, and they decided to start the meeting with a report on the monster's corpse they had found yesterday. The conditions they were given were a request to move the processing of the magical stones mined there to the east, and a claim that there was not enough wood at the Blue Turtle Guard Post. There was also a claim from the south that the number of monsters had increased. There were requests for help from the Red Raven area, and their troops were asking for replenishment every day. Because of this, one of the guys present suggested a large-scale mop-up before winter came. Tarkin couldn't neglect the administration of the plane because of the war with Sylvanus. Everyone was also curious as to what kind of person the princess was. For no matter how many times they questioned Durant, he never answered, for he was rather dull. The same could not be said about Durant's subordinates, because there could be problems, because they could act rashly as they might like the princess. Durant intervened in the conversation and told them to choose their expressions because this girl was the future consort of His Highness. The boys were indignant, for they did not understand why they had to choose their expressions when talking about the Sylvanians, and if they were at war, they had to put up with these scoundrels. They were quieted by Tarkan, who asked if one of the boys had found out why the princess had been isolated, for she had said that if they searched a little, it would be easy to find the fact. Lowering his head, the man said that before the princess arrived, he had come to Tarkan to make a report. But the prince had said that it was good starter material and had burned it all up and had threatened to say that if the lad wasted his time, he would waste it on firewood. This was his report, which he wrote diligently, for it was not fair that the prince should do that to him, for afterward, he could not utter the letter P as it is in the word princess. Listening to the boy's indignation, Tarkan realized that it was indeed true and asked him not to cry, for he might wet the carpet, and also told him not to delay news about her and to report to him at once. All the boys present were very surprised, for His Highness had changed his orders, and when they saw each other in life, he really liked the girl. Cockroach said that even though the war with the Empire was over, she was the most important key, so it would be good to know everything about the princess. He couldn't find General Mukali either, as it turned out, he had gone to the Western Front Line on a survey to make arrangements for him to return through the main gate. But it looked like he hadn't gotten used to life in the palace. Tarkin, on the other hand, wanted to say something else, but suddenly paused. At this point, they were still in the process of negotiating with Sylvanus. But because they were discussing a peace treaty, they were too relaxed. Their opponents were much more persistent than the monsters, and the warriors were willing to accept any order from His Majesty, and go through fire and water overcoming even thorns. The prince, on the other hand, said to contact a cook skilled in making cakes, even if he was from another palace. This request made everyone even more surprised. The next morning, Aracena woke up not realizing how long she had slept, for it had been a long time since she had slept washed clean, in clean clothes and on a stable bed. She didn't want to get out of bed because the blanket was very soft and made of sheep's wool when she got up, she saw Tarkan sitting beside the bed. When asked what he was doing here, he answered that her husband didn't need a reason to come to his wife's bedroom. Aracena didn't expect him to have free time and said that he should have just woken her up instead of waiting because he probably had a lot to do. He was about to wake her up when he got to Aracena's house, first waiting outside and for the first time, waiting for someone to wake up, not realizing how she could sleep for so long. 
Though the Sylvanian was very small and she must have been tired after the long journey, after which he decided to go to the training ground. Close to noon he got busy with his work report and all such things. Even though everyone was awake, the princess hadn't gotten up yet. While he was waiting for her, her maids offered to have a cup of tea with them before she awoke. He realized that these ladies were the same companions that had taunted the princess when she first arrived in Irugo. The day came and the princess had not risen and Tarkin was confronted by court ladies who unnaturally blocked the way and he burst into the sleeping lady's room seeing the sleeping bride. Looking at Aristina, he was embarrassed because a man who looks at a sleeping girl is not able to wake her up, which was quite a popular situation in movies. She assumed that Tarkin couldn't wake her up because she looked like an angel and he was embarrassed. So he quietly snuck to the curtain of her bed and covered himself with tea and secretly looked at her. Despite the fact that Aristina respected that people have different tastes, asked him to refrain from exercising them on her. He then handed her an envelope of papers. There was a list of aristocrats who would be participating in the event of the delegation's arrival, and it was better for her to know their names before the afternoon audience with his father. Tarkin probably shouldn't have presented such information to the princess of an enemy nation, but he trusted her. She had to meet his expectations and said that they had to arrive not in advance, but at the exact right time. Otherwise, they would run into the royal scions and be an eyesore to them. However, Aristina said that they needed time not for that, because there were things that needed to be taken care of before the audience. But first, she offered them something to eat. Before the audience, the headmaid said that everyone should be introduced according to their titles, and there should be no mistakes, as this was a very important event. Then it was announced that His Highness Tarkin and Princess Aristina of Sylvanus had arrived with a delegation. They went there under the arm and all the people of the palace were surprised to see the princess because they realized that the rumors were false. They were welcomed by the king and also by the queen who asked if the long journey was not too long for her because she was worried because they had decided to use old-fashioned carriages instead of the portal. When Tarkin was 10, he was killed by the mercenaries, but they failed so he was sent to the front to fight the monsters of the plains. That man was the queen. While his father was busy with foreign policy, the queen strengthened her position in the palace. The queen is supported by the conservative aristocrats who hold high positions. And on his side are the warriors and the new aristocracy that hold small positions. Despite 10-year-old Tarkan's talent with a sword, he was just a child in a field teeming with monsters. And he was sent there to his doom the queen will not be afraid of any means to put her son Hamir on the throne. On the outside, she may appear to be affectionate, but if you dig deeper, she is not. When Aracena went to meet the king, the royal children praised her knowing how dirty she was when she arrived, because the higher you fly, the harder it hurts to fall. She told the queen that she had traveled to stop the rivers of blood flowing in the war, so it didn't matter how hard the journey was, she couldn't be bothered. Because of the war, the commoners of both states suffered. Therefore, as a princess, she wanted to check with her own eyes. She saw the life of the people, and in comparison to it, the physical pain of the princess is insignificant. From everywhere there was talk that Emperor Sylvanus had brought up his daughter well, because Princess Sama had decided not to use the portal, and was very kind-hearted. Count Eskela intervened in the conversation, saying that apparently the princess wanted to show off her best side and then their ego and appeared in Irugo's outfit. Everyone noticed it only after his words because they were so delighted that they did not notice neither weaves nor bows on Irugo's outfit and did not understand why because she had brought her own dresses. The count was the queen's father and Hamir's closest associate. But in fact, her maids had talked to her about it too because she represented Sylvanus and therefore she had to wear the dress the emperor had given her. But after a month on the road, the dress was soiled and she could not wear it. The count went on to say that the king of Sylvanus was very arrogant because he had sent not only a tribute, but also a beautiful princess. And the princess, as part of the imperial family, understood everything perfectly. There were dozens of conversations around the girl, who talked about the fact that the Sylvanus had dared to attack Irugo and had even taken away part of the territory. 
that was why it was so important to send the princess. Some felt that they should have sent not the first princess who was in confinement, but the second, what is called the Jewel of the Empire. She realized that all these people were under the queen's command and were hostile to Tarkan. Just a few words, and they could cross the line as if they were just waiting for the moment. So she decided not to be silent and said, which was quite strange since the princess that stood before them was ending years of hostility between the states in order to establish peace. She came in a carriage and put on their attire, and they allowed themselves to say things that undermined the meaning of this peace, and it sounded as if they all wanted to start a war. The Count, however, smiled tensely and said that the princess's speeches were very dangerous and he could not afford such terms. After all, they had only recently signed a peace treaty. Esker realized that he had just almost gotten into trouble and was glad that they had cleared up the misunderstanding. Because if he went any further, he could be accused of disobeying the king. He realized that the princess had nerves of steel and he assumed that she would be trembling with fear like a common wench. However, she looked at him carefully, as if waiting for an answer. Aracena went on to say that her expectations of the Count had been too high, and she had overestimated him. He was furious, because he didn't understand how she could estimate him, because this girl was nothing even without pedigree. He couldn't even guess what she was wearing, for it wasn't Arugo's outfit, but Sylvastian's Karelian silk. The maids advised the Count to look closely, and then he would understand everything, because it was a pure red color that looked like warm ruby, and of course it was Corellian silk. Sylvanus was so proud of this silk that they named it after the country, and this Corellian silk was of the highest quality and was a pure shade of red. However, it was not part of Danny. It was a perfect idea, because the silk that Sylvanus was proud of was used to make Irugo's outfit. It was appropriate and symbolized the unity of the two countries. The girl realized that the Count had fallen for his own trickery, and that she had received only one outfit from Emperor Sylvanus. But unfortunately, it got dirty and shabby on the way. But these hyenas did not know it, so before the audience she soon took a favor from Tarkan. They wouldn't have time to make a sylvan dress because it takes a long time to cut and sew. Luckily, you paid attention to the flowing shape in Irugo's clothes. The silhouette came out too simple, but by agreeing to embellish the dress with chains and fittings, it was finished quickly. She thought about mentally thanking the Count for reacting the way she wanted. The King, who was watching the whole scene, said that only the Princess was thinking about peace and the future of the two countries among them, and thinking that she was tired, offered her to sit down. A maid who was shaking with fear came to them, and said that due to lack of chairs there was nowhere to seat His Majesty Tarkan and the Princess. The queen looked upset and said that it looked like the head maid had made a mistake, saying that it was her fault because she was excited about the fact that the war was over and the old hostilities were no more. Aristina realized that it was all a lie and the queen was pretending that she was not to blame. However, the queen found a way out of the situation by pointing to the farthest free table. However, the matter was bad. All the servants understood that the queen wanted to put the couple at the most insignificant place of all, because there were places for servants. The queen saw nothing wrong in it, because they could no longer make people stand there as if they were being punished, and thought that they were just chairs, and should not be given much importance. And the princess was not so petty that she would destroy the peaceful atmosphere because of such a thing. Looking at the princess, the queen was extremely puzzled, because she didn't understand why she was so happy, because she had given them the farthest seat. She was frightened because she assumed that Aristina knew in advance that she had lured the head maid to her side and had prepared to retaliate. Tarkan's instinct screamed that when the princess had that look on her face, something very dangerous was going on. Tarkan said that the reception had not yet begun and the queen already looked intoxicated. Otherwise, she would not have put the princess in the most remote place because the princess herself could be called a symbol of peace and he could not believe that she would put such a person in the farthest and smallest place. All those present were surprised that His Majesty Tarkan had made himself known to the society. He was an eternal, silent young man, and it was all for the sake of the princess. The queen replied that that was not what she meant at all, for from the outside it would seem that they were making the princess stand because she had done something wrong, so she simply offered her a free chair. 
Cockroach replied that in that case, someone could give her a seat. After all, they were highly respected members of the royal family of Irugo. He believed with all his soul that for the sake of peace, they could vacate just one chair. The third Prince Martin, the same age as Tarkan, who was very afraid of him, rose from his seat and said that for the sake of the beautiful princess, he would of course give up his seat. However, Aristina said that this was not enough and they had to go together, as husband and wife should be side by side. She realized that her business partner was trying hard for her. They had come this far, so it was impossible to let Tarkin sit at a distance. She went to one of the princesses who had been mocking her the most. Stelina didn't know whether to give up her seat right now, because that was how she could save her honor. But to her surprise, the princess passed her by and went to Annika, saying that since she and Tarkin would be a married couple, they should sit next to each other. Their marriage contract was a symbol of peace. Plus, Annika said she was extremely excited about their wedding. Annika realized that asking to sit in someone else's seat also had political overtones, but there was no point in touching the empty seat because her goal was to be the most powerful member of the royal family in the absence of the first principle of peace. And she realized that no one would want to give way to a fool like Princess Aristina. However, the king intervened in the conversation, saying that Annika had a bad leg and it was better for her to sit on a comfortable table. But the princess did not expect the king to intervene. Aristina realized that Princess Annika was the king's main favorite. So in this situation, she should not expect him to take her side. So the second princess got out of it and said that she really wanted to give up her seat. But unlike the others, she had a frail constitution and a leg problem, so she couldn't do it. The king said that the servants should have brought them free chairs instead, because husband and wife had to sit together and ordered to put the chairs right next to him and the queen. The earl was indignant, for it was a place for the crown prince, for in a royal family there should be lawful order. However, the king laughed and said that they were just chairs and they would just put them on the empty seats and there was nothing to be done because the queen had mistaken the number of seats. At that moment, not only the people supporting the queen, but also the neutral aristocrats balancing between the two forces were deeply astonished. Nobody expected that the situation would change so much and now Prince Tarkin, who had avoided political decisions before, has taken the lead and the queen has been pushed aside. Moreover, the princess was in the center of all these events. Having gone upstairs, she could see the whole hall and everything looked very small from above. Tarkan asked who the princess was always looking out at the end of the hall. But when she didn't want to tell him, he said that if it wouldn't cause any problems, he didn't care. Aristina once again looked to the end of the hall where she saw the same man she had seen through the emperor's eye. A month ago on her way from Sylvanus to Arugo, she had seen the future while she was getting water. In her vision, she had a private conversation with this guy, promising that he would become the best, not only in this country, but in the entire continent, he was to become the best blacksmith. That was the end of her vision, and to be honest, she was a little surprised to see such a picture of a bride-to-be in this country because at first the image looked like a scene from an immoral novel, yet they had met so unexpectedly at a banquet. With a glance at the blacksmith, she realized that that man would be the main workforce in her business plan, and she wanted to talk to him right now. But since she had already made quite a ruckus today, it would be better to sit quietly for the rest of the feast. She looked at the blacksmith again, and was surprised that his hand was fine, because in the future she had seen that he had no thumb on his right hand, but she still didn't know what the relationship between them was, and why she was so confident in her words about him becoming the best blacksmith in this country. She would want to prevent his injury before it was too late, for an injury to a blacksmith's hand was fatal, for she was sure there was a way to save the hand of a man who would be loyal to her. She planned to find out all the information about him as soon as the banquet was over. But now she was distracted by the insanely delicious food, which had never seemed so wonderful to her before. Then she was served a jelly frinfrin, and the girl was happy, because the sweet and sour flavor of the jelly really exploded in her mouth like firecrackers, and she ate it all in a flash. Tarkan, who was sitting next to her, pushed his bowl of jelly away from her and said that she could eat it if she wanted to. 
Everyone else watching the couple thought they looked great together and chatted very nicely, and some of them even wanted to try to make conversation with the princess after the banquet. Diona didn't understand how their relationship could change in an instant, and why she was the only one who should feel awkward. But she was already very much worried about Mr. Tarkin, because his future wife was interested in another man. After the official meeting between Irugo and Silvanus, Tarkan's gloomy palace was lively for the first time in a long time, and many people were discussing the newly arrived princess. This was not only because of the fact that Princess Silvanus turned out to be elegant and beautiful, but also because of the incident in which the queen was humiliated. Irugo produces a large amount of quality steel, and if she could combine the blacksmith she had found with Irugo's metallurgy, her business would be a success. At the same time, she could fulfill the king's wish to get rid of the stigma of a barbarian country. One of the maids happily announced that the princess's wedding dress would be made using sylvan fabric and Arugo's traditions, as they had been at the banquet. She was also given several designer-designed sketches for her to choose how her wedding dress would look. The girl, however, said she would just wear whatever they made for her. One of the maids said that this was not the way to do it, and her personal opinion was that she did not like the dress made in the tradition of Arugo. Rosalind rushed to her defense, asking how she dared to speak so disrespectfully of Her Highness the Princess, to make fun of her accomplishments, and to continue to call herself her careerist. The maids were always fighting amongst themselves because they didn't have enough time for the princess, and Irugo's residence were switched nights. She also ate well and slept well, perhaps because of her surroundings, but the dessert she had eaten earlier seemed to be even more delicious. One of the maids finally chased away the court ladies, saying that the wedding was a one-time thing, and the princess's opinion was very important because she asked what she wanted. And even if it was something insignificant, they were ready to do anything. Aristina said that she wanted something soft to keep her warm and comfortable to sleep in. The maids were delighted and went off to find something suitable, happy that the princess and Tarkan would definitely sleep together and snuggle. At the same time in the hallway, Rosalind continued her argument, along with a fight with another maid. However, they were interrupted by General Mukali saying that he would like to visit the princess. The maids realized that this was one of the closest people to Prince Tarkan. He did have a terrible scar on his face. Rumor had it that he intimidated the soldiers with his monstrous physique. Now Mukali realized that the Sylvanians were very cowardly, which meant Diona had not thrown words to the wind and the princess was the same. Diona's brother Santra was a dedicated warrior, so much so that he was ready to sacrifice his life. For their sake, he was a loyal and handsome young man, and before his death he asked to take care of his sister. When Diona told him this, he thought he had misunderstood, because according to her it seemed that the princess, who would soon be married, already had another man's interest. The man was ready to find proofs of it and reveal the truth, because he felt sorry for Tarkhan in case it was true. There is a famous experiment called Pavlov's dog. It consists in that if before each meal to strike a bell, only at the sight of the bell, the dog will release saliva. Though Aristina was not a dog, she realized that if Tarkhan came to her, tea would soon be served, and if tea was brought, desserts would come along with it. She wondered what they would bring today and with what kind of tea. But in fact, if you ask the servants, this question could be easily solved. But because in Aristina's mind this area was Tarkin's property, she thought it would be very rude to ask someone to grant her wish. When Tarkin ascends to the throne, she will finally be free from the danger of being killed by her father's mercenary, Emperor Sylvanus. And with her capital, she would be able to confidently purchase whatever she wanted to eat. Before he entered the princess's room, Tarkin overheard her saying that she would like to sleep on something soft, and, frightened, he said he would not do that to her, and ran away embarrassed. Aracena did not understand why everyone was so strange today. At the same time, a maid came to her to bring her tea and thought she was too late, since the prince had already left. Today they brought her apricot jam and strawberry compote and a cake with melted cream. It was double luck for Aristina as there were two servings. But before she could eat, the maids burst in and said that she had a visitor who called himself General Mukali and insisted on bringing him to her. The princess didn't even know who Mukali was, 
The maids explained that he was as close to Prince Tarkhan as Durant. This ruthless man was terribly frightening to the Sylvanian. Walking into her room, Mukali noticed that she was small and assumed that now she like everyone else would be stunned and then scream, though he was disgusted by this reaction. But today, his scar would play into his hands because he had come to warn the princess. However, to his surprise, the princess was genuinely happy and smiling. Plus, she didn't wrinkle her nose at the sight of his scar. He used his most formidable tone and came in all arms saying that he heard that she was asking about the other man. The girl, however, smilingly said it was true and offered him a seat asking her maids to bring the general some tea. She remembered how Tarkhan at the banquet had asked her why she was interested in that man and why she was looking at him so closely. And she couldn't tell him and only answered that it was a business secret. But in order to find out more about him, she had to join forces with Tarkin because she had no support here. But after the reception, Tarkin had become very grumpy, so she had no choice but to ask the servants. But her inquiries were not fruitful. Sitting at the table with the princess, the general did not understand how it happened that he ate delicate cakes together with the girl Thumbelina. Aristina asked him if he could help her to find a man, and without noticing it, the general fell for the princess and did not understand why he should help her to find a man. In any case, if he agreed, how was he different from the courtiers and warriors who made a fuss over the arrival of the princess? Did she really think that if she made everyone reveal secrets, she could control Arugo as she wished, and he was going to make her realize reality? Addressing her rather rudely, he noticed her confused look on her face, however he suddenly stopped, for he had an annoying feeling. His intuition that always saved him on the battlefield told him that he shouldn't be angry now, so he decided to pretend to help her and then catch her red-handed, which would be irrefutable proof, and in that case, no words could save her. Aristina went on to say that she was thinking about what to do, for now her freedom of action was very limited, and she could not send the maids away and go out alone to meet a man. Even though the maids had told her everything, and she had a list with all the details she did not know much about him, like what he liked or what he was interested in. After these words, General Mukali realized that Diona was right, but he did not understand why his mood had changed so much, because he had found out her secret, which should have given him satisfaction. He asked how she could leave their prince. The girl answered that it was not that, because that man had other talents and excellent physical shape, unlike Tarkin. Mukali did not believe that His Majesty was in bad physical shape and was not going to listen to this nonsense any further. Arasina noticed that Mukali was not consistent in his decisions. He belonged to that class of people who considered their commander to be the strongest man in the world. And though she didn't want to say it, she only needed a little embellishment. So she said cheerfully that she thought Tarkin was an excellent partner who was not inferior even physically. The general was completely shocked because they were not married yet, but their relationship was developing very quickly. After all, before such little girls like this Thumbelina had to be fed seven times a day, and he did not understand how you can touch her.